All right. What I want to do here is analyze what should be a really simple cross, but was, we'll find out we get different results depending on the sort of assumption we make. And the cross involves a mythical creature that you may be familiar with, Mr. Potato Head. And in Mr. Potato Head, uh, the traits related to the presence or absence of nose are controlled by a particular locus. So that if you have a Mr. Potato Head who is either homozygous dominant, big D, big D, or heterozygous, big D, little d, that Mr. Potato Head is going to have a nose. But if the Mr. Potato Head is little d, little d, that is homozygous recessive, he or she is not going to have a nose. And let's consider that there's a second locus which relates to the presence or absence of glasses or needing glasses. So if you, at this locus, if your Mr. Potato Head is either homozygous dominant or heterozygous, that Mr. Potato Head needs glasses. If the Mr. Potato Head is homozygous recessive, that Mr. Potato Head does not need glasses. And so with that, let's analyze the following cross the way we normally do it with a Punnett square. And so I'm going to take a Mr. Potato Head who is heterozygous, big D, little d, big L, little l. So notice we've got our gene pairs. And we're going to cross that heterozygous Mr. Potato Head with a Mr. Potato Head that is homozygous recessive for both sets of genes. In other words, little d, little d for the locus related to the presence or absence of nose, and then little l, little l, the genes uh, related to not needing glasses. And so we're going to do this relatively simple cross. And the way we've been taught to do it is to say, OK, take this individual here and find the gametes. And you might know, remember that each gamete gets one gene from each gene pair. So this is a gene pair. So half the gametes are going to be carrying the big D allele. And the other half of the gametes are going to be carrying the little d allele. Same thing for this gene pair, given the way we normally work Punnett squares. So we end up with four possible gametes from this individual here. DL, the other possibility is D little l, little d big L, little d little l. These represent the alleles that are carried by each of the four possible gametes. Now, this parent's pretty easy because this parent is a double homozygous recessive individual. The only possible kind of gamete is going to be carrying little d and little l. So when we do our standard combining, say, all the eggs with all the sperm possibilities, we end up with these four possible genotypes. Um, half of the offspring are going to be heterozygous, big D, little d. The other half are going to be little d, little d. Half of the offspring are also going to be big L, little l. There's one of them right here. Here's the other one. The other half of the offspring are going to be little l, little l, that is homozygous recessive. So we have four possible offspring and, and in terms of genotype, and all the genotypes are expected to be equally frequent. Now, in terms of what the offspring actually look like, that is, what their phenotype is, well, again, we've got uh, equally frequent offspring. One-fourth of them are going to have a nose, but they're also going to need glasses. Another fourth are going to have a nose, but not need glasses. Another fourth are going to have no nose, but need glasses. I don't know how they get the, the glasses to stay in that situation, but that's another issue. Um, and then finally, one-fourth are going to have no nose and no glasses. So this is what we expect given the way we normally handle Punnett squares. Now, what, when we do the Punnett square technique this way, what we're assuming is what Gregor Mendel would call independent assortment. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare that situation with what is sometimes actually quite common, what we call linkage. And in linkage, the different gene pairs are not going to segregate independently. Certain combinations of genes are going to follow along together 
because of the way meiosis behaves and the way chromosomes behave in meiosis. So let's see that in the next slide. Okay, so on the left, I have the standard assumption of what we call complete independence. Now, what complete independence usually means is that you have unlinked gene loci. Linkage refers to what chromosome the genes are on, whether they're on the same chromosome or different chromosomes. And you, if you have unlinked genes, like I'm showing here, um, the genes related to nose, presence or, absence of no, presence or absence of nose, are located on a pair of chromosomes, a pair of homologous chromosomes. But the genes related to needing or not needing glasses are on another set of chromosomes that are not homologous to these guys. All right. Now, uh, when you do that and you look at the gametes, what you find is that one-fourth of the gametes are, are going to be D and big L. One-fourth of the gametes are going to be D, big D that is, little l. One-fourth of the gametes are going to be little d, little big L. The other fourth of the gametes are going to be little d, little l. And that relates, as you might re recall, to how the G chromosomes behave in uh, meiosis, particularly in uh, prophase one. Remember that homologous chromosomes pair up uh, and then we do crossing over, and then the pairs go to the middle of the cell where each pair lines up end to end. So you have, in this case, you would have two pairs of chromosomes, this pair and then this pair, and they would be lined up side by side. Okay, and, But how they line up is independent. That is, the orientation of the bigger chromosomes, in this case, is independent of what's going on with the other set. And that is what we do, the assumption that we make normally when we do a Punnett square. But remember that a chromosome doesn't just have one gene. There are literally, in some cases, thousands of genes that are linked together physically along the same chromosome. And when you have linkage, what that often means is that when the gametes are formed, certain combinations of genes, because everything is linked together on the same chromosome, they tend to go together. So let's look at the situation of non-independence. In this particular situation, I've set it up so that the blue chromosomes have the dominant alleles, big D and big L, where the red chromosomes have the recessive alleles, little d, little l. In this situation, again, you have four possible gametes, but notice what's going on here. In the first situation, you have D and uh, big D and big L going together on a chromosome that is all one kind of genetic material, right? Down here, we have little d, little l <clears throat> on a chromosome that's all the other kind of genetic material, right? Now, what's going on here? You might remember that the other thing that happens in prophase one of meiosis is crossing over. And uh, homologous chromosomes will swap bits of DNA. So let's suppose there's a crossover event, event that is in between D and L. Well, what's going to happen is that you're going to end up with these two possibilities here. You're going to have a chromosome that is big D, little l. Notice the red from here. The other possibility is little d, big L. All right. Now, these two middle possibilities, if you have linked loci, they're going to be less common than the other two possibilities because the genes here are physically linked together on the same chromosome. And the closer they are, then the less common these guys are going to be. So you're not going to see um, one quarter and one quarter and one quarter and one quarter. You're going to see that this type and this type of chromosome are going to be most common. These two types collectively are going to be less common. All right. So let's see how that plays out when we compare what we have here with independence versus linkage when we actually do the cross. All right. So in the first situation, um, I've got my 
cross set up like I would normally do for a Punnett square. And here are the phenotypes of the offspring. Okay. And then down here, we have the results that you would expect if you had a thousand offspring. And I've got to make a little correction here. There we go. So suppose that from this cross we get a thousand offspring. If we don't have linkage, that is, if we have independence, then all these phenotypes are going to be equally frequent. So I expect them to occur 250, 250, 250, and 250 out of a thousand offspring. That doesn't mean I'm going to observe exactly that. Just like when you flip a coin, even though you might expect 50% heads and 50% tails, by chance you might get, you know, 45 heads and 55 tails. Same kind of thing going on here when you don't have linkage. Okay, but let's take sort of an extreme situation and suppose that when we go back to here, D and L are so close together that there are no crossovers between those loci. Okay, so we don't see any of these guys. It's kind of an extreme situation. The reality is somewhere in the middle. But if we have this extreme situation, that's what I'm showing right here. Okay, so 500 out of 1,000 offspring are going to be nose needs glasses, okay? Zero are going to be nose but no glasses. And zero are going to be no nose but needs glasses. And then 500 are going to be no nose, nose glasses, okay? That difference comes about because in this situation here, the big D and the big L, since they're physically linked and they're so close together, you don't get any, you don't observe any uh, crossing over events, okay? In reality, and the same thing down here, this is uh, the other possibility. You don't see these guys because we don't have any crossover events. Now, this is kind of neat because even before we understood anything about uh, how chromosomes were constructed, scientists in certain, using certain organisms were able to construct maps, what we call linkage maps, showing where the loci for each trait is, at least in an organism like fruit flies, that we can have a lot, look at a lot of individuals. In humans, that's doing that sort of linkage mapping is much more difficult to do. But we were able to, you know, before we understood what chromosomes were like, take advantage of the fact that if the closer loci are together, the less likely you are to see any crossover events. And that gives it, gave us a way to map genes. Okay. Now, linkage is still important today when we're, when we're thinking about breeding and we want to preserve certain combinations of traits. Uh, and it's important in uh, pedigree analysis for humans even today, where now we can uh, look a little bit more closely at, at what we call linkage groups than we used to be able to do. It's also important when we're thinking about evolution and how evolution might um, happen where you've got two loci that are behaving independently versus what happens when you have linkage. And it turns out that when you have linkage, you get some really interesting things going on that are kind of outside the scope of this course. All right. So in the typical Punnett square situation, what we do is we assume independence, but realize that in the real world, since chromosomes have lots of linked genes along their length, then uh, the real situation oftentimes is one of non-independence, at least when we're talking about uh, a pair of homologous chromosomes. All right, so this is a little bit of additional information that you should look at uh, for lab practical number two if you're in my um, online section or my face-to-face -face section.